Hello, and thank you for tuning into Answers from the Lab, where we share Mayo Clinic knowledge and advancements on the state of testing and science from laboratory leaders and the people who are making it happen behind the scenes. I'm Dr. Bobby Pritt, the Chair of the Division of Clinical Microbiology in the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. With me today is Dr. Bill Maurice, the Chair of the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic and the President of Mayo Clinic Laboratories. This is our weekly discussion with Dr. Maurice in which we learn about updates in the field of laboratory medicine and pathology. Well, hi, Bill. Great to talk to you today. Hi, Bobby. Yeah, I'm coming to you from sunny San Diego. So uh, I know. Don't rub it in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, rainy thunderstorms here in Rochester, Minnesota. So soak up the sunshine while you're there. Yeah, I will indeed. Good, good. Well, you know, I thought today we could talk a little bit more um, kind of feeding off of what we talked about before with CLIA and what it is to have a CLIA lab, uh, certificate. And, you know, we throw around the term lab director, but I don't think we've really defined that yet. You are uh, one of our main lab directors for DLMP, our Department of Lab Medicine and Pathology. So I thought we should talk about that and what goes into being a lab director. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And particularly, um, it's because it's, it's, it's a topic that's coming up more. I think it, it first kind of got attention through the Elizabeth Holmes and the Theranos story and what did that mean, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's, we've talked a lot about regulation and now there's a lot of new companies that are doing direct to consumer and they'll talk about that they have a CLIA lab and what is that, but what does that really entail? Um, so it's, you know, it's interesting. Um, first of all, getting a CLIA lab means that, that is, it, that's issued through CMS, right? That means that you're recognized as a registered laboratory with CMS to perform clinical work. That's kind of what the CL stands for, is clinical laboratory. Um, it's not that difficult to get a CLIA license. You just have to apply for it and pay a, a pretty nominal fee. But the, what the implications are quite profound because then you are legally responsible to CMS for the care provided by the laboratory. So at Mayo, actually, we've had an interesting history with, it, with our CLIA licensure. Right, CLIA lab director. So uh, you're right. I'm the CLIA lab director actually for all laboratory activities at, 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 at the Rochester campus. Mm -hmm. So both within the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology, and we have some labs that actually are not in the department that are that have a CLIA license. There was an, an inspection event uh, back in like 2012 when Dr. Cockrell was the chair, uh, which triggered an institutional assessment of risk. And that's when they decided that the DLMP chair should hold the CLIA license for all of the laboratories on the Rochester campus, which means I'm now legally responsible for the, for the testing at SDSC, our SDSC building, our Hilton building, and then other laboratories on the campus. Mostly, I think a couple might be in the Guggenheim building. So the CLIA license are really dependent. It's actually a physical location. The lab's considered a physical location. One individual can be the CLIA lab director for up to five physical laboratories. So that's, I'm kind of at my max. Yeah, well, you know, that's something that, uh, something we also don't talk about, like CLIA licenses and that it, they are for different physical locations. So in Rochester City in uh, Minnesota, we have our, what we call our SDSC, our Superior Drive Support Center Labs, which is quite a large operation. And then we have our downtown laboratories and they're different physical sites. So they have yep. different CLIA certificates. Yeah, so you're our lab director for both of those. That's right. And that means I'm legally responsible So for all the testing. So if there's anything, and we did have an event triggered uh, that I mentioned, uh, if something triggers a CMS inspection, uh, for us, it was proficiency testing that had been referred to us. And that's a big no-no uh, for proficiency testing, just to reference it, to refer to another CLIA uh, laboratory. That actually triggered a CMS inspection. They want, once, they, once they can inspect a lab, they can inspect everything. Um, and then the lab director is legally responsible. If something is found to be in violation, um, the lab director, which is going back again to Elizabeth Holmes, people are familiar with this, they can be barred from being a lab director for up to two years. Mm -hmm. And the facility, the laboratory, can also be barred from performing clinical testing for up to two years, which means that if I was found in violation, they could actually stop Mayo Clinic from offering clinical testing in all the locations for which I hold a CLIA license. The challenge with that is that those regulations are really written, they're not written to be flexible. So that, that you know, the same regulations that apply to a small laboratory 
you know, with running a few tests, it has a CLIA license, applies to, you know, our multiple laboratories on our campus that you spoke to that provide over 3,000 different tests and did 27 million tests last year. So it's, uh, so it's a big, big responsibility. Yeah, you can imagine what that would mean for Mayo Clinic and all of our patients. If we didn't have a laboratory, that would shut down a lot of the clinical care we do because, of course, you need the lab in order to make a lot of diagnoses and, and treat and monitor patients. That's so right. It's it would have been, be pretty cool. Yeah, a disaster. So yeah. a lot of responsibility on you. No pressure, right? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> but that's a, the flip side of that, though, we've talked about this. It's a clear license, as I said, relatively straightforward. It's CMS, mm -hmm. so you don't want to violate it. Uh, obviously, right? You don't want to do the wrong thing for patients. That's why you don't want to violate it. But the reality is that a lot of the quality that uh, that we invest in and others, they actually deem or they, they, if you will, delegate to another authority, in this case, CAP, College of American Pathologists, to do those inspections. So, and those inspections, of course, are much more detailed. And so for us, with the size of this operation to be responsible, that means we had to build out a very uh, significant quality infrastructure because so that I can be accountable for all the activities happening in the lab. So we have lab directors in our lab, but actually from a CLIA perspective, they are not recognized to be the responsible person. I am. So we've made major, just like other labs, because the, the, the regulations themselves are not scalable, that means that we need to scale our, our, our processes and our people to accommodate. And it's not just for CLIA. I mean, we've talked again about things like ballot and regulation and FDA, and why do we think about those things? Well, we think about those things because the labs are already pretty heavily regulated. So just for our laboratories alone, we have over eight national agencies and 10 state agencies that inspect us and can come in and inspect us every year. So, I mean, it's a significant, significant undertaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, we talk, we throw around this term lab director and I say, oh, I'm the lab director of the clinical parasitology lab. But in the eyes of CLIA, you are registered as our lab director. And really, I'm serving in a role more as a technical supervisor or a clinical consultant. I still have my responsibilities, but it ultimately goes up to you. And I was reading up a little on this, um, giving some lectures in our leadership and management course to our, our residents and fellows. So lab directors not just have to have the right credentials, right education and training, but have to demonstrate active involvement in the lab's operation, available to lab staff as needed. Uh, and there, there's this whole list of responsibilities, um, you know, making sure that there's competent, qualified personnel. You can delegate some responsibilities, but there's a list of things you can't delegate. So how do you do all this, Bill, and, and also be our chair and, and all of the other roles that you have? Yeah, and, and get time to sleep and those things. Yeah. yeah right, right. Um, well, I think it's a really important for anyone listening is to really understand if you're working in a laboratory, um, who your lab director is, if you are, you know, if you're a lab professional, if you're a, a PhD or MD, I'm really understanding what your responsibilities are because they are they are legal responsibilities. And, and it's often even within our own department, we have to really educate people on where, what their role is from a regulatory and from an oversight perspective, to your point. Um, so how I do it is it's really, it would be impossible without a lot of delegation, but you have to recognize your point that that delegation, even if I, even if it is delegated, isn't necessarily legally re recognized. So there's no way that I have the expertise. I don't understand parasitology and how to run a parasitology lab like you do. You, um, you know, there's all sorts of laboratories. You have over 60 labs in our department. So the way it's done is you have to really be very clear has to be, that's where I get the process. You really need to put, it's called a quality management system. That really is a whole system that allows people that are working in the laboratory, people that are providing oversight to the laboratory to understand what they need to do, to make sure that it's done and documented, and to make sure that I interact with it as appropriate as a CLIA lab director so that, I, so that everything flows up through me and that accountability flows up through me. But the reality is that the work has to be delegated. And, there are some things that are just difficult that we have to live with. So as a, for instance, every procedure change um, that happens and in, in, in time we'll change a lab procedure, we need to document that. We need change control. We need to sign off. Even though, again, there's over 3,000 unique tests in the department, as a CLIA lab director, I have to sign off on every one. Now, clearly, I don't have the time to read procedures for over 3,000 tests nor the expertise to find something, which means, again, 
We have to make sure the lab directors, to your point, are interacting, and we have a whole quality staff as well. We have a quality office, which has 50 staff, and then we have over 100 people in the department with quality in their titles to make sure that all this work happens, is documented, is consistent, and is communicated up through the lab directors, which are the technical lab directors to me as a CLIA lab director. It's, it's, an, it's, an, amazingly, um, it's an amazing system that works, but it really is. It's a lot of work. So, yeah, I can't even imagine. And, and how many documents do you sign each year about? Oh gosh, thousands, thousands. Yeah, yes, thousands. It is yeah. thousands. We have an electronic site signature system coming in, which I will be very appreciative of. So, and again, actually, having my signature on those was not actually because of CLIA or CMS. It was one of the state agencies that inspect us. I said, no, we want Dr. Maurice's documented signature on every one. So mm -hmm. it's like if one regulatory body asks for it, you have to adapt because we can't comply just with some. So it really is again really important um, for labs and people working the labs to understand what their obligations are and to really invest in the infrastructure to support it. Because unfortunately, well, first of all, it's the right thing to do for our patients. Mm -hmm. And second of all, it is, a, you know, it's, it's a legal responsibility. Right. Well, the things I'm hearing is first of all, what's so essential is leadership from you people that you can trust and rely on because you are ultimately responsible, even if you're delegating, and then systems to ensure that everything happens and is supposed to happen to have that quality management system. And I know that you're heavily involved in that. Uh, from personal experience, you were involved when I uh, interviewed for the division chair position. And so I think that that's something that we look for in leaders too, that engagement and being involved in picking the people that you're then going to be delegating to. Yeah, that's right. I think a couple of things, I mean, for some, particularly for, like for the physician, the PhD staff, we can often look at quality as just sort of a, a mundane activity that you just have the lab do. Well, it's a lot more than that, right? It's, it really is about the surety that our patients have that when they get a test result, it's reliable. You need a system. Look, things happen. The agents go down. We have some performance issues. Ideally, our quality systems will pick those up before they happen, but if they happen after or even before, they have to be communicated up. The other thing with quality is that if you step back from medicine and just look at just other industries, if you will, I mean, quality is really about how you do your work. And really, and we've talked about this with PAMA and with that you know, we have to really drive towards efficiency. So we have to make sure that we, we should really view quality not through the lens of checking boxes for regulatory agencies, although that's part of it, but it's really about continuously innovating and improving our processes so that they're reliable, so that they're efficient, and so that they serve patient needs. And I think if you take that frame of mind, quality becomes energizing, even though it is a lot of work. Yeah. Well, being accredited by, you said, eight national and 10 state agencies, and then knowing that we're here to serve our patients, you know, there's a lot of people we're accountable for or accountable to. And so having those systems are, are essential. Exactly. Yeah, that's why I call them quality system essential. So perfect segue <laughs> to the end. So, no, but yeah, so it's good. It's, 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 I'm glad we had a chance to talk about it because it is yeah. a major undertaking. It's a significant investment. And it's really something that people need to be aware of. Because there's a lot now that there's more and more of these, particularly after COVID. So there's a lot of, of companies out there saying, oh, we have a CLIA license. We're safe. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're making those sorts of investments in quality. So really understanding the labs that are serving you, that they really are high quality laboratories. They're not just putting a banner out there. And then for those of us in the lab, really understanding the importance of quality um, so that we're not just compliant, but that we're doing the right things for our patients. Yeah, and probably also asking the question, if it is a small lab that you may not have heard of, is who's the lab director and what quality systems do they have in place? Who are the people that are ensuring that the tests meet quality standards? Yep, yeah, that's right. That's and there have been... That recent situation with Elizabeth Holmes. Yeah, sorry, Bruno. Yeah, exactly. And I think even yeah. that's something you can do is, is look and look at the CLIA lab director if you have a lab. And sometimes you'll... You know, you'll find they don't have training in laboratory medicine. There's a lot of things that can kind of be a little bit surprising. So, um, so yeah, that's a great idea. Well, it's a really good talk and something we could uh, refer back to because it's kind of the bread and butter, but, you know, things that we talk about every day and uh, nice to define it with you. Yeah, no, I'm glad to have the opportunity to talk yeah. about it. Um, and most of it's really, I think it's important that people understand how mm -hmm. much work labs do to make sure the tests that they get are really reliable. 
Um, you know, it's, it's a lot. It's, it ref, reflects the passion that we have for, for our, our practice of medicine. Absolutely. Well, I'll let you get back to your meeting. Uh, enjoy the nice sunshine. Uh, I'll think of you when I'm, you know, walking in the rain later today. And uh, I'm sure we'll be talking about more about quality in the near future. I think so, too. And yeah, I'll try and bring some sunshine back with me. <laughs> Great. I love it. Thank you, Bill. I'll see you. Talk to you soon. Thank you so much for tuning in to Answers from the Lab. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to tune in every Thursday and every other Tuesday.